Back in the United States, Gail Vance Seville, the director of Sensory Spectrum, invites Remy into her laboratory of sensory analysis. Bonjour. This is where the fate of our food is decided. Before a product hits the market, everything is tested. Texture, acidity, flavor. Today, a strawberry yogurt is being put to the test of the lab technician's palates. Okay, sweet. Do I spit it out afterwards? We would always tell you to spit it out. Mm. Okay, how much of it is strawberry? Three? Mm -hmm. Three. Two. Two, and a half? Two, and a half. two and a half? Two and a half. The character of the strawberry is what? How much? Four. Four? Four. 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 You do this technicity, all, all your different programs are this technical, right? Or even more technical. Everything for descriptive analysis is taken as detailed as possible. Okay. So for flavor and texture, we would probably also do appearance, especially if it's being tested with consumers as well, mm -hmm. because they often react to the way things look way yeah. before they ever react to the way things taste. Yes. And do you do this like in your everyday lives? Do you <laughs> set aside yeah. tasting things and so right? You're often asked when someone like your husband or your you know whoever you're dining with knows what you do, and they'll say, "What is that weird thing in your food?" And you have to say, "Do you really want to know?" <laughs> Both appearance and texture seem to be essential ingredients in the miracle recipe. Let's take the best-selling cookie, Oreo, which is a sandwich cookie filled with cream. Oreo is sold in over 100 countries and generates $1.5 billion in turnover for its manufacturer, Kraft Food. However, research has shown that nutritional quality is not part of Oreo's makeup. The cookie contains complex sugars, fat, barely 7% coca, and whey powder instead of milk. Good morning. But even when we know that, we still come back for more. Why? What's funny to me is, is Oreo cookies, which are one of my favorites. What makes me want to eat those things? What elements do you think that may make us really want to come back to a food? Why Did, is this so great? Yeah, why is it so great? Why is an Oreo cookie? Have an Oreo cookie. <laughs> but what makes this an interesting product is, going back to the texture experience, it's got flavor, interesting flavor combinations, but it has the contrast between the creamy center and then the crispy, crunchy outside. Mm -hmm. And so you're biting into the cookie, and unlike just having a plain sugar cookie where you have to do all the work to make it wet it down, the fat is there to help you wet it down. And then um, you're getting the vanilla sort of from the center and the chocolate from the outside coming together in the, in the flavor. And so it's a, it's a very nice combination of, um, of factors. So the, Art of this is to develop flavor combinations and texture combinations that work together so that you're not left with this um, aftertaste or afterfeel or residue of stuff in your mouth. So you have to have something that is palatable. So between See, the explain the word, explain the word palatable just before palatable you go on. meaning that people will consume it and that it's actually edible and l well liked by people so that they're uh, craving it or, or really like looking for it. So let me take this back. These are mm. my cookies. You don't keep my cookies. No one is able to resist the products tested by this taste guru who leaves nothing up to chance. Even Remy fell into the trap. Every year, the food industry spends $3.5 billion on research carried out by labs like Sensory Spectrum. That would buy a whole lot of tap dancing lessons. Oh, it's my, my pleasure. Okay. Ciao. Have a very, very nice trip. On top of the taste, the texture, the color, and the shape of the packaging, isn't there some other little extra, some chemical formula, some invisible ingredient that could account for our compulsive attraction to these chips, pizza, and chocolate bars? Remy sets off for Yale University, where Kelly Brownell studies the impact of poor eating on our organism.
Well, there was one at one point in human history, if there had been food labels, they would have had one thing on them. It would have been whatever the food was. And now there are 50 different chemicals, lots of different sugars, colorings, flavorings, preservatives. And these things fool the brain. The, the human brain was never designed to handle this chemical onslaught. And so the, the foods have been stripped of things like fiber that might have given you some sense of how much you've had and make you feel full. And a lot of things have been added to them that maximize their sensory properties. And they explode in this burst of sensation with flavor, with smells, with colors, and you're entertained by the food in a lot of different ways. And that maximizes the sales of the company, but it also seems to maximize disease in many cases. Amongst these 50 different substances, there is one that stands out above all others, sugar. We have already seen that the consumer is naturally attracted to sugar, therefore industrials gladly add it to everything in its many forms. In the last 50 years, sugar has become the star of the kitchen. In the past 30 years, its worldwide consumption has tripled. Remember the saying, you are what you eat? But today I'm on my way to Le Mans to meet Angelique, the nutritionist. Her work is really interesting. This morning she's teaching people how to read a product label. Angelique Aubert, nutritionist in Le Mans, helps people understand and master the contents of their shopping carts. She even gives classes in label reading for those who are really lost. Take this savoury buckwheat crepe, for example. The label says the crepe contains water, buckwheat flour and salt. So far, so good. Then there is the bechamel sauce. That's where it starts to get complicated. Then wheat flour, vegetable fat in the form of coconut oil, which is a saturated fat. Then there's a wheat starch, modified potato starch, which is far from natural and is metabolized by the body, just like sugar. Then we have powdered milk, dehydrated butter powder and glucose syrup. What is glucose? Sugar. sugar. That's not good, is it? I've skipped the milk proteins, the spices and all the rest. Since we met, I've stopped eating sugar. That's very good. Is this something you eat? Let's look at the ingredients. That's what we're here for, right? Sugar. Do you put sugar in your vinaigrette? After the practice comes the theory. Let's summarize. Take a list of ingredients. The shorter it is, the better. Look for the presence of sugar in all of its forms, OK? Definitely eat less fat, less sugar, less salt. Please avoid sugar, and it's everywhere, in everything. Fat was singled out because it was thought that fat made people gain weight. It's not the only factor. You really must watch out for the sugar contained. I was just telling Remy that in 1830, we had five kilos of sugar per person per year. Five is not that much. And how much do we eat today? 18. 20. 50? 50. That is an average. In 2010, we consumed 50 kilos of sugar per person. This is why you must keep a watch out for sugar. Easier said than done. The food industry has taught us to like sugar from day one. Sugar is present in baby food from the earliest stages, from four months onwards. All children's yogurts, the pretty coloured ones with the cute pictures, contain sugar. All children's food, sugary breakfast cereals, contain lots of sugar. Happy children with satisfied taste buds will come back for more. When you overload on sugar from an early age, what are the consequences later on in life? Can processed foods lead to addiction?
These sorts of questions are beginning to interest researchers around the world.